Okay, we're going to start in two or three minutes. Can I remind everybody, aren't you taking a test today? So I believe you're taking an exam sometime tonight or tomorrow morning. I will start in two or three minutes, okay? All right, we're going to start in one or two minutes. All right, I think we're going to start. Can I remind everybody of two things? I believe you're taking a test today. Be sure to take your exam before tonight or tomorrow morning. And the exam you're taking is 789, and we reviewed for it last time, so be sure to take it. We're going to start new material. Now, here's the other big deal. The next exam is not 10, 11, 12. The next exam is chapter 10, 12, and 13. So we covered chapter 10 already. We're now moving to chapter 12, and that will take me a full two days. So I'll have to do it today and uh, Wednesday, and we'll be done with chapter 12. And next week, we'll do chapter 13, okay? So again, two things. You're taking a test today. I'll remind you several times. Be sure not to go to bed tonight before taking the test. And uh, today, we're going to begin a lecture on chapter 10, 12, and 13. And I believe we're doing chapter 12 today. All right, I have to do what I always do, however, and that is minimize this. Yeah, unfortunately, I shouldn't have done that. All right. Uh, da -da 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 so it's chapter 12 we're doing. All right, so there we go. Share. Sorry about this. And it's this one here, I think. Good. Okay. So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. And let's move this up. Okay, we're all ready. Uh, by the way, you know, we're near the end now. We're three quarters of the way through the semester. I think we have something like seven or eight class meetings, which is only about four more weeks. So time flies when you're having a good time, right? All right, now this stuff could, would, or would be, or might be on my Christmas test. And when I say Christmas test, it really isn't that close to Christmas. It's more like the 15th of a month or so. So the middle of, of December will be a test on this. So be ready for it. All right, let's begin our lecture slowly.
Okay, I'm trying to remember. See, I do this lecture. I have multiple sections of this, but I'm pretty sure I haven't done this with you guys yet. So, the name of this is Network Management Administration, but it's really what we always said, a lot of techno babble, technical stuff, okay? When Windows is installed, okay, well, let's do this one. What is a user account? A user account in Windows is your name and password. So, J. Smith, password Mr. Cool, that's my user account. P. Jones, password Mr. Cool, that's my user account. Your name and your password is user account. When you think of an account, think of a bank account. A user account is simply your logline name. Now, it has to have a password to go with it, but your logline name is user account. That fact itself won't be on a test, but the next fact may be. Bianco, good to see you. Okay. I gotta do it this way. Okay, this I could care less about. They're talking about the scheme for you making your name. Should it be uppercase, lowercase? Should it be your first initial, last initial? Um, I have very little to say about that. Let me just check this guy in who just came in. So there's nothing about that I really want to say. That won't be on any test. Okay, on the other hand, the password is, is very important. Uh, I think we have something on today's test about the password. Uh, password's always case sensitive. The password might have a minimum length. Remember, you know, there's no built-in minimum length, but you have to set one. And you all know what complexity is. That is, what's a good password? Uppercase, lowercase, numbers, blah, 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 okay? And you have to change your password every so often. So in other words, the user account password is very important. What I'm trying to say is how you name the user, whether it's Jay Smith or Joe, Joe Jones or whatever, or whether you use some cool name like Mr. Cool, that's not important. But the password is very important. Should it have a minimum length? Probably. Should it be complex? You may want to do that, yes. Okay? Should you have to change it every so often? Almost definitely. And all they're saying is once naming conventions have been established, stick to them. Again, that's not that important. Okay, here's the first cuidado. When Windows first installed, two users are automatically created, administrator and guest. That's a person called the administrator person and a guest called the guest person. Now, those are the only two users Windows first has when you log in. You say, well, wait a minute, there's 25 people here. What do you do about them? Well, you make a user called P. Jones and, and uh, uh, Gertrude and Zelda. You make a user for everybody you want, yourself. But the administrator and guest account are the ones automatically created by Windows, okay? You can't delete those and you can't get rid of them. You have to leave them there. Why? Because they're automatically created by Windows. Now, the cuidado is, this one's okay, don't worry about it. It's this big one. What's the administrator? That's what's known as a super user. He's the one who has full access. Super user means he can go, he can see anyone's files and folders. He can change his own password, anyone else's. He has complete control. He or she has complete control of the network. So the administrator is the super user account that has complete control of the network. And it's automatically built in. What about deleting it? Can I delete the administrator account? You can't. It's not even possible. If you tried to do it, it wouldn't happen. You must have an administrator account. Why? Because you have to be able to untangle fishing line. If there was a real problem, you say, well, the administrator account can fix this. Oh my God, I deleted the administrator account. Don't worry about it. You didn't. It's still there. You can't delete it even if you wanted to. What's the administrator account? Full access to everything on the computer. Now, this is interesting. There's the administrator and there's the guest. Well, wait, what about the, all these other things? Never mind. There's the administrator, there's the guest. Those are the only two accounts. Well, what are all these things? Those are something else. Those are group accounts. The only regular account is guest here and administrator here. Now, I'm skipping all this garbage. Now, this is very important, and I'm going to talk about these two slides. What is a group account? Well, a group account would be a group of people that does something. Like, what do you think the sales group would contain of? All the salespeople. Or well, what do you think the accountants group would contain? All the accounting people. 
Okay, what about the inventory managers group? All the inventory managers. So you're gonna have a lot of groups that you put people in as group accounts. And that's important because it's an easy way to assign permissions. So in other words, if I've got 24 accountants, I gotta assign permissions to these files to all 24 of them one at a time. Much easier if I put them in a group called accountants and assign permissions to that group, and then I don't have to assign to you, then you, then you, then you. Are you in the group? Then you got the permissions. Are you in the group? Then you got them. Just put them in a group and assign permissions to the group. Now, it sounds like, well, let me do it this way. You must have a user account because you'll log in that way. You can't log in as salesman. You got to log in as Jay Smith or Gertrude Jones. You got to log in as you. Well, once you're in there, you can get most of your permissions from membership in a group account. So a group account, and it requires only a name, but the name ought to be, what, what's the word? Commonsensical, meaning, what do you think, who do you think is in the sales account? All the salespeople. And who do you think is in the account called, group account called accountants? Probably all the company accountants. And who do you think are all in the ones called inventory managers? Probably all the company inventory managers. So you're gonna give the group accounts names that have some logic to what they're doing. I'm not going to do this part of it. I'm just not. I could. I'm just not going <laughs> to. Remember, I'm going to spend two full days on this lecture. So I'll get as far as I can today. But I have to finish this by Wednesday. So Monday and Wednesday will be on chapter, third, uh, chapter 12. Okay, here's where it gets very sexy. Who are the two user accounts? Administrator and guest. Oh, anybody can memorize that. Even I can. Now we have a problem. Who are the group accounts? Group accounts made. Well, we have an account called administrators with an S. We have an account called account operators. We have an account called backup operators. We have an account called guests. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God, Professor. We got five, six, seven uh, group accounts. I can't remember them all. Yes, you can. It's not that hard. Let me try to explain. Don't confuse the administrator person with the administrator's group. So the administrator's group is a group of people. Who is the first member of the administrator's group? The administrator. So there's an administrator's group, and then there's an administrator person in that group. Who is the first member of the guest group? The person called the guest. You know what I'm saying? Now, the reason I want to talk about this one more than the other one is the following. I've got one administrator in the administrator's account. What's his name? His name is administrator. So we only need one. Yeah, I only need one during the day, but he goes home at night. What if we have uh, triple shifts and I got a guy who's got a problem at eight or nine o'clock at night? Well, my administrator's home in bed. I don't want to pay him overtime. So what I need is somebody who's working the night shift to be the administrator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Jay Jones, who works the night shift administrator. I'm going to take him and put him in the administrator's account. When I put him in the administrator's group, he becomes an administrator. Now, he's not renamed. His name is still Joe Jones, but he now acts like an administrator. What does that mean? He can do anything he wants. He's a super user. But if I don't think he's doing a good job, I can take him out of that group, and then he goes back to being Clark Kent again. So one more time. When I put him in the administrator's group, he has complete power over the entire network. If I take him out of the administrator's group, he loses his power and becomes a regular person. That way I can put a lot of people in there and make them temporary administrators. You're the night administrator, you're the weekend administrator, see what I mean? And they have a misbehave or don't do it right, they take them out of the group and they're back to normal people. Don't confuse administrator's group with administrator person. Don't confuse the guest group with the guest person. Now, that's it for this lecture, this part of it, except what do you think um, print operators do? Well, print operators do everything with printers. So I don't want to make you an administrator on the whole network, but could you be in charge of all the printing? I'll put you in the print operators group, and all of a sudden you've got control of all the printers. What do you think the server operators group do? They control all the servers. I don't want to make you administrator on everything, but you know, you're pretty smart. You'd be good controlling the servers. I'll put you in the server operators group, and you can operate all the servers. What I mean? Be cuidado. Every new user you make, every person you create, automatically becomes a member of the users group. One more time, every time I make a new person, J. Jones, P. Smith, Gertrude something, he or she becomes a member of the user's group. Why? Because she's a, he or she's a regular user. And what I want to talk about, you notice how this thing is going. I'm spending what? 
two or three minutes or five minutes on one lousy slide. There's not a lot of slides in this section, but each one's going to take a while. Let me talk for a minute, though, about the third one down, the backup operators group. This is a little bit tricky. The only way I can back up stuff is I have to have permissions to get to the file. So I, I'm, you give me permissions to all your files and I can back them up. So we go to the president and say, you got to give this low level person permission to your file. He says, why? Well, he's doing the backup and you won't be able to back them up. The president says, screw this. These files are very uh, 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 private. I don't want this low level person, I don't know, to, to see the files. I'm not giving him any permissions to my files. Gee, then he can't back them up. And that's how it used to be. It was a big problem. So what happens with the backup operators group, if you go into the backup operators group, you can back and restore any files, but you can't open and read the file. So what that means, you can go to all the president's files, you can back them up, and if there's a crash, you can restore them. And these are private files of the president's only. You can back them up whenever you have to, restore them whenever you have to. But if you say, gee, I wonder what that letter says. I think I'm going to read it. Eh, it doesn't let you. So you have full access to all the files for backup and restore, but you can't open them and read them. That's what the backup operators group. And what it does is it allows me to sign a low-level person to do a lot of backup and restoring without worrying that they read private files. Um, I won't have any questions on my test about listing and naming all the groups, but if you were going to take a, a, a network plus, you might want to understand. So you see what I'm doing? There's only two users, administrator and guest. That was the only two made. But with groups, we got a big problem. We got administrators, account operators, backup operators, guests, print operators. Now again, can you add other groups? Yes, you can. But those are the ones that Windows makes themselves. You can't delete these groups, you can't rename these groups, but you can completely ignore them if you want to. You can just not use them. But you can't delete them and you can't rename them. But you can just not use them if you want to. Okay, let's go slowly. Now, hint, hint, hint. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have the right class because I'm lecturing this to three sections. So I have to make sure I'm right. But the profile is very important. And this would be on my last test, hint, hint, hint. Your personal profile is how good looking you are, okay? This has nothing to do with this. Your profile here is not the shape of your nose or your chin and how good looking you are. This profile is how your computer looks when you log in. Look what it says. Collection of users, personal and settings that define their working environment. You have a computer at home. You turned it on this morning, okay? And when you turned it on, it, it automatically booted up, right? Because of the BIOS, it booted up. Whatever you looked at, that was your profile. What do you mean what I looked at? Well, you probably have some kind of wallpaper. Maybe it's the Windows wallpaper. Maybe you put some um, beach wallpaper. Maybe you put some uh, Hawaii, who knows? You have some kind of background. You probably have some shortcuts. Maybe you have some video game shortcuts. Maybe you have some tax shortcuts. So whatever your computer looks like when you bring it up, that's your profile. That's it. Your working environment, personal files and settings, what it looks like. And that's your local profile. Meaning, when you went to bed last night, your computer screen looked a certain way. When you got up this morning and logged in, you expected it to look the same. And guess what? It did. Why? Because it's your local profile stored on your drive. And it looks the same when you log out at night and log in the next day. Right? That's the selection. Here's the cuidado. Pay attention. All this stuff could be on my next test, hint, hint. What's a roaming profile? Well, I like it to follow me. What do you mean follow me? Well, I'm, I'm sitting here in my hallway. This is my laptop. When I log in, where's my profile? It's on my C drive on my laptop. Where's it going to follow me? This is my only laptop. It's not going to follow me anywhere. But when I'm in school at Bergen, I have an office on the third floor. When I log in as Professor Gary Correa on the third floor, I got a certain profile. What if somebody calls me two buildings away? Now I'm on the second floor in the tech building. I don't want to log in there as Professor Gary. Well, I can't log in from two buildings away on this computer because it's on my C drive. But when I log in at Bergen, no matter where I log in, I get my same screen. Why? Because my profile follows me. How? Now, they've got it through screwy here. They said store in a network share. What that really means in plain English is instead of my profile being stored on my C drive in my third floor office, it's stored somewhere on a server in the B-Wing. So wherever I go in Bergen and log in, my profile follows me. Now, what do you mean my profile? My screen top. 
my screen saver, my desktop. I log in, it looks the same wherever I go in Bergen. Now, this profile here on this computer at home, if I go someplace else and log in, it will not follow me. Why? It's on my C drive and it can't follow me. The one at Bergen can't because it's on my server. That's a roaming profile. Would you want a roaming profile in your house? Probably not. Would you get a roaming profile at the company you worked in? Probably yes, because there, whatever floor you go to, whatever office, it could follow you. And not all companies have it, but but it's done typically. What about a mandatory profile? This is tricky, so be very careful. If you buy some H&R Block tax software and you install it, it makes a shortcut and it stays there. Is that okay with you? Sure, because you bought the tax software. That means that any change you make to your profile, you can keep the change. And that's the way it is. So if tonight you decide to add another video game to your computer and you make a shortcut to your log on screen to the video game. Do you expect that shortcut to be there tomorrow? Absolutely. Why? Any change you make is okay. That's not a mandatory profile. That means any change you made, you can keep. A mandatory profile would be the company doesn't want you making any changes and they won't let you keep it. So if you make a change to your desktop or screen saver today and you log in tomorrow, what happened to it? It's gone. Yeah, because you're not important enough. We're not letting you make these changes. Oh, I'll make the change again today. Ha, 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 I got you. Well, I'll go off tonight, come in tomorrow, it's gone again. What are you doing to me? No, you can't make changes and save them. So if I discard the changes when you log off, that would be mandatory. Yeah, this is important for a test. Normally, your profile is a local user profile. That is, on your computer at home, it's a local profile stored in your C drive. When you log in, you get the same everything. If you make any changes, you're allowed to make them, and that's a regular user profile, local profile. End of lecture. For the smart people only. If you're at work, you might want the profile to follow you around. That's a roaming profile. How would you make it follow you around? By taking it off your C drive and putting it on a file server. So if I log in here, I get the profile. If I log in over there, I get the profile. If I log in on the fifth floor, I get the profile because it follows me because I made it roaming by putting it on a file server. Regular profiles are not roaming. You could make it up. Now, mandatory. Regular profiles are not mandatory. What that means is you make the change, you can keep the change. If you can make the change and keep the change, it's not mandatory. If you can make the change, but the company won't let you keep any changes, that would be mandatory. It discards your changes because it doesn't like you. I'll give you a little story on that because I think you're in my different section. I used to work for a company where, due to mismanagement of the management, the stock used to be $30 a share. Because the company was so much managed, it went down to $0.30 cents a share. So the stock went from $30 a share to $0.30 cents a share. So one of the wise guys in the company thought it was cool that he got the stock chart off of a Wall Street thing that showed the stock plummeting, and he made that his background. He made that his wallpaper so that whenever he logged in, he saw the company stock plummeting. Well, obviously, the company didn't think that was funny because they were people who screwed up. So they made it mandatory, which means that every time he changed it to put this plummeting stock thing on, he had it for the rest of the day. When he logged off and came in the next morning, it was all gone. But I mean, because I didn't want him doing it. So that would be a case where you'd make it mandatory. All right, I want to move on to the lecture, but let me just do this. For a test, what's a profile? What's a local profile? What's a roaming profile? And what's a mandatory profile? I hope I get a chance to do this again, but uh, and I may have a chance once, but we're, we're, doing, we're doing another chapter this week, another chapter next week. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are getting a little tired, we're near the end. I think we have to this week and next week no more new material. So if you can just make it a few more weeks, we'll have finished everything. And remember, the next test is, I believe, sometime in the middle of December. So we're about a month away from the next test, and then we're done with the whole semester. See if you can hang on a little longer, people. Anyway, know what a user profile is, know what a local profile is, know what a roaming profile is, know what a mandatory profile is. Okay. I'm not going to talk much about the Linux accounts. I just don't feel like it. Oh my God, this is one hell of a lecture. 
partitions. Uh, you know what? The whole way around this. Uh, the guy I was doing this today. I'm going to need my little marker thing. I'm oh, sorry about all this. I'm really sorry. I forgot I was doing this lecture today. This is an important lecture. All right. All right, so let's try this one here. Partition. Primary partition, extended partition, up to four of them. When I format my hard drive, I can format my hard drive into partitions. Now, be cuidado. Primary and extended, not primary and secondary. So what does it say? I can't find that little stylus thing. Oh, son of a guy. Well, I'll find it somehow, but there it is. So let's begin. Primary and extended, okay? Oh, I, I'm going to just say things. I hope I can write them down, but I, 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 don't, I seem to be in total confusion here, so I may not be able to. Let's begin. I can have up to four. One primary, one extended. Two primaries, one extended. Three primaries, one extended. And now, give me a drum roll, four primaries and no extended, or three primaries and one extended. So primary extended, primary extended, primary extended. Okay? I'm really screwed here because I don't know where I put my little uh, stylus thing. And if I can't do that, I don't think I can use my fingernail. No, it won't work. All right, so let's, let's keep going. Uh, oh, oh, how did this move? Here it is. One primary, one extended. Two primaries, one extended. Three primaries, one extended. Four primaries, no extended. Or three primaries, one extended. Now, what does the bottom one say? In the extended partition, it says, I can have logicals. So what I can have uh, an extended partition with one logical, an extended partition with two logicals, an extended partition with three logicals. Ming goes in. No, that's not it. Okay. I may not be able to do this today. I don't know why. I, I can't find my little stylus thing. I'm not going to go rummaging around the floor trying to find it. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Very good. No, I'm spastic. Well, first of all, I hate teaching online. Here we go. Okay, so th there it is. Now watch. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, right? There's four of them. This is a P as in primary. This is a P as in primary. This is a P as in primary. This is an E as in extended, okay? So this would be the C drive. This would be the D drive. This would be the E drive. Now here's where it gets tricky. This is extended. This would be the F drive, G, H, I. And they say, wait a minute, there's only one here. Well, this is the F drive. This is the logical. This is the G. This is the logical, H, I, J, K. This is the logical drive. So what I'm saying is the extender can be broken into multiple logical drives. First primary is C. Second primary is D. Third primary is E. The first, the extended, the first logical is F. The second logical is G, and then H, then I, then J, then K, then L, M, N, O, P. I can have as many extended as I, I can have many logicals I want to in the extended. Primary and extended, not primary and secondary. I can have as I can only have four regular partitions, 
put as many logicals as I want to inside the extended. I, it's called studying. So look what I wrote here, read the effing book and understand what I just said and read the thing. It's called studying, you just have to memorize it. So, and the next slide is worse. Thank God I found my little marker. The next slide is absolutely worse. A uh, hint, 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 all this stuff is for the mid-December uh, test. All this stuff is for the mid-December test, okay? Not the test you're taking today. All right, you think that was hard? Let's go on. Okay, this is one of the trickiest lectures you're gonna have, and this will definitely be on my last test. First one is we have to boot up. The active partition is the one you boot up from. So when you turn it on and the computer boots up, there's gotta be one partition. That's the active partition. But now it says the primary partition that stores the bootloader is called the system partition, and the one that stores the operating system is the boot partition. Well, let's see if we can get this, because this is a little bit tricky, and this will be on a test. Be very careful. So I got to do this. I got to do hit this. Screw that. What keeps happening? Why do I keep doing this? Oh, okay. I, 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 there. Okay, now. Yeah. I'm getting good at this, but I'm not. So, I knew something called the boot files. And then I'm gonna have something called the system files. Now, it's pretty obvious, and this should be an easy part of the lecture. What do I do? The first thing I do is boot up my computer, and then I load the operating system in that order. First, boot your computer up, then load the operating system. Wait, well, you know what? I think I'm going to do it the other way around. Why don't I load Windows first and then boot up the computer? You can't do that. How can you load Windows first and then turn your computer on? You can't. What do you got to do? You got to turn your computer on and then load Windows. Well, maybe I'll do it the opposite way. You can't do it the opposite way. You got to have your computer on before you load Windows. So the boot file says you boot up first and then you load your system files. No, no, I want to do it the opposite. Go ahead, try it. It's impossible. It's always in that order. Does everybody see that? Well, now let's read what it says here. It says the active primary partition storing the Windows system is bootloader is called what? That means, I got to get this right. Yeah, I'm still writing. Okay. That means that the S-Y-S-T-E-M partition. And then it says here, the partition holding the operating system is called a boot partition. And that's what it says. Now, you say, wait, professor, I think you made a big mistake. But it says, it's telling me the boot files come first, but they're in the system partition. And then it's telling me the system files come next, but they're in the boot partition. It's got to be a misprint. Well, let's read it. It says the active primary is the system partition. Bootloader, system partition. Then it says the OS, operating system files, is in the boot partition. No, that's got to be a misprint. It's not a misprint, it's true. You mean to tell me that the boot files are in the system partition and the system files are in the boot partition? Yes, I do mean to tell you that. That's exactly right. But it doesn't make any sense. It should be the other way around. You know what? You're probably right. It probably should be, but it isn't. Now, I know what you're going to ask. How and why did this happen? Well, long ago, before some of you were even born, when they invented Windows 3.1, which I think was in, what, the 1980s, and some of you may not have been born yet, the um, engineers doing it at some convoluted kind of moronic stuff, and they ended up with this, what I call dichotomy, where the boot files are in the system partition, the system files in the boot partition, and they never corrected it. You see why this is a very favorite test question. So if they ask you on the Network Plus test, where would you find the boot files? And there's a bunch of multiple choice questions. You're going to say the boot files, gee, they got to be in the boot partition. And if they say, where would you find the system files? And it's a multiple choice question. You're going to say, gee, system files, they got to be in the system partition. Well, maybe they got to be, but they ain't. It's exactly what I wrote here. It's counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what it should be, but it is what I said. Okay. Um, this will be on my test, almost definitely be on theirs test. And the reason they always ask it, I think, is to um, see who studied and who didn't. The guy who didn't study says boot partition must be boot files, has to be. Well, maybe have to be, but it's not. 
Is it counterintuitive? Yes. And there's some very esoteric reason why this is true, how they renamed it or something like that. We used to argue about this when I was younger, and I forgot the argument. I don't really care. Know this for my test, know this for their test. You begin to see something, though. We're doing a lecture here where I'm spending five, six, seven minutes on each slide. Um, that's not great, but I'm doing it, <laughs> okay? And that's what, that's what this requires. I'm assuming that the dead silence means you all understand this. I probably won't be doing this very often. I may do this lecture again next time we meet. But this stuff would be on my Christmas test or my mid-December test. Everybody got this? Can I move on? All right, let's go. Okay. Fat has nothing to do with the size of your waistline or your belt buckle. Fat is how we format the hard drive. This is a cool lecture. I'm watching my watch here. We're at 356. I'm going to make a few points here. We should be out of here by 415 today, partly because I'm a little bit um, tired of doing this. But remember, we're going to finish this chapter, though, between today's lecture and next time's lecture. To remind everybody just one more time, you all have a test today. Be sure to take the test today. Okay. All right. Fat. Okay. How you format your hard drive. Now, FAT16 and FAT32 have to do with something. Uh, never mind that. This is how old-fashioned Windows held its data, okay? What do you mean old-fashioned Windows? Windows 3.1, uh, Windows 95, that kind of stuff, okay? Pre, pre, prehistoric Windows. Today, we hold the data and it's called NTFS. Now, NTFS is, a, it's called, you know what NTFS stands for? The Windows NT File System. NTFS stands for the Windows NT File System. And it was invented with Windows NT in the 1990s. Well, wait, Professor, didn't you get the memo? Windows NT was in the 90s. We're up to Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows 7. What happened to Windows NT? We're still in it. Instead of going to NT4, NT5, NT6, they started renaming it cleverly. So Windows XP was just a form of Windows NT. Windows 7 was just another form of Windows NT. Windows 10 is just Windows NT and steroids. We're still in Windows NT, and we're still using the NTFS file system. Okay. Now, here's the big cuidado. Why is the Windows NT file system so good? Oh, there's 10 or 20 reasons, but I'm going to go through two of them first and then the big one in a minute, and we'll see how far we get after that. Oh, one more time. Modern Windows all uses the NTFS file system. Old-fashioned Windows uses FAT and FAT32 file system. Modern Windows, NTFS. Old-fashioned Windows, FAT and FAT32. Quickly, Windows, Windows 10 still has backward compatibility with FAT, but we never use it anymore. All right, let's begin with this one. Why is the NT file system so good? Well, all these are reasons, but because I'm lazy, I'm only going to give you two of them. I'm going to jump to one reason that's a big mother-sticking reason why it's so good. Let's begin with this one. Let's take this quotas. There's an overweight gentleman sitting in my front row. His computer is completely filled with stuff to overflowing. I give him permissions on my server. I say, uh, Joe in the front row, you can have, go to the file server if you want to. Joe immediately goes to the file server, and he completely fills it with all his junk. So when Gertrude and Shane get to the file server, they say, Professor, there's no more room on the file server. What happened? Oh, I have plenty of room. Joe got there first. He hogged the entire file server. Could I set a disk quota to limit the amount of data he can use? So what happened is, when Joe goes to the file server, he fills it up with, say, I don't know, five gig of data. And then it says, sorry, you're done, you're full. Oh, wait a minute, I got a 300 gig hard drive. Why can't Joe go past five gig? Because the quota says he's limited to five gig so other people have enough room. So what I could do is I could limit the amount of disk space each user could use if I'm using the TFS. Okay. Now, is this built in? Be careful what built in means. The capability to do this is automatic, but it's not turned on. So you would have to go and turn it on and then set the amount. Is it five gig? Is it four gig? Is it three gig? What are you going to limit them to? So the capability to do this is automatic, but it may not be turned on. You have to turn it on to let them do it. But you could do it, and that's a big deal. 
You can't do it with fat. It won't work, but it will work with NTFS. The other one I'll go over quickly that you might be interested in is this one down here, which is file compression. What I could do there is I could, instead, if, I'm, if I'm filling up my hard drive and I'm getting filled, I could simply say, turn on file compression, take all the files and use an orange juice squeezer to compress them. So when I close the file, it will be compressed. When I want to open the file, it expands the file and I can read it. Then when I close it again, it will be automatically compressed. What does that do? It gives me more room on my hard drive. I can do that if I want to with NTFS. I can't do it with fat. Okay. And there's several others that I should cover, and I will. So that's the reason why, right? Well, those are two important reasons, and one of the two or both of them might be on my next test antenna. But that's not the main reason to use NTFS. That's not the main reason. It's a much bigger reason. Oh, it must be one of these. No, they're interesting, and I'll cover them some other time, but they're not the big reason either. Give me a drum roll. Here's the big reason for using NTFS. It's this guy. Well, I'm going to skip ahead. It's this guy. With NTFS, I can give you permissions. Now, what do I mean by permissions? Okay. Jane in the first row, would you mind putting all your data on my file server? Well, Professor, uh, uh, I'll consider it, but I got a problem. Some of my data is garbage. I'll put it on the file server, everybody. But these letters and these uh, pieces of information, they're very, very private. And they're very, very important to me, and I don't want to lose them. I prefer to not put them on the file server. I really wish you would. I put them on the file server, everybody has access to them, and they're confidential to me. Ah, I got a deal for you. What if I order you to put all your data on the file server, but with this proviso, you can control who can get to what. So all your junky data that you don't care about, you can let the riffraff in the class see it. But remember those three or four files you said were so important? You can decide, should everybody be able to read them? Should anybody be able to read and write to them? Or there's another option, should you do none of these things? They're on the file server, but nobody can even see them. So I could give you read only to a file. I could let you read the file and write to the file. I could let you read, write, and modify would be I could then delete the file or alter the file. Or I could let you have full control over the file and give permissions. In other words, it's called granularity. I'll make you put your data on the file server, but I'll let you decide. And the other one, I got a better one. Isn't it? I could have everybody read it. But if you want to, you could say, okay, you, you, and you can read it, but you, you, and you can't read it. It's very complicated, but if you want to do that, be my guest. And you, you, and you, and you can read these files, but you four over there, you can't even see these files, so I don't like you guys. That's fine, too. So you can give read only, read and write, read, write, and modify, or full control. You can't do anything like that with that. This was a godsend. I'll tell you why. You, nobody would put anything on a file server if you couldn't control it. So if I said, put all your data on a file server, and by the way, everybody in the class is going to see it. Why? I, I'm writing the term paper here. I got a resume here. I don't want the whole class seeing it. Okay. Put it on the file server, yes, and then you can decide who can see it by you deciding who has what permissions where. You can give the class read permission, but you can also give three people in the class read and the other class nothing if you want to. You see what I mean? You have granularity of control. So, NTFS is a really big deal. Let me go back. I said that NTFS is a full-featured file system, start at Windows NT, and I made a big deal about how they can have disk quotas, which FAT can't do. We're going to have file compression, which FAT can't do. I could encrypt, I could encode the files, which FAT can't do. But the biggest important thing is not on the slide. What is that can do? I can give permissions with NTFS. I can say who can do what. Now, let me tell you a couple things. This was meant to be done only on a file server. On your computer at home, you probably have Windows 10 or Windows 7, one of the two. And if you have Windows 10 or Windows 7, you're using NTFS. Could you set disk quotas on your computer at home? You probably haven't bothered to do it, but the capability is there, which is yes, you could. Could you compress all the data on your computer at home? You probably haven't bothered, but yes, you could. Why? Because it's using NTFS. But here's the big drum roll. If you wanted to at home, could you assign different users different permissions? Well, you're probably the only person who uses your computer, so this would be pointless to do. But could you do it? And the answer is yes, you could. 
Why? Because you're using NTFS. Now, this is not a, uh, a Bill Madden 108 class. I'm not interested in keystrokes. I'm not interested in how you would do it. And I'm not interested in teaching you how to set these things up. It's very interesting. I, this is not part of this class. My point is, your computer has a lot of a lot of things you could do on it that you never bothered to do that you probably didn't even realize. See what I mean? And this is one of them. The fact that you could do NTFS, that you could assign these permissions, that you could put in disk quotas, that you could put in compression if you wanted to, and you have to look it up how to do it. But if you're using NTFS, you can do all these things. And, and again, you're not running a server at home, you're running a regular computer. But because I know you're running NTFS, you have the ability to do all these things. Okay. I'm going to go a little further, but I'm going to stop early today. So, fat was the old way. And by the way, fat has none of these. No disk quotas, no compression, no permissions. Once I go out of fat, I can have this one. I can have disk quotas. I can have compression. I can encrypt the file. And, drum roll, drum roll, I can give permissions. And that's the biggie. That's the biggie. I can give permissions. Okay. I'm trying to see where I'm going now. If I want to, oh, I didn't get to this lecture yet with you guys. Uh, yeah, we have a little more time. I don't want to stop too early. Can I remind everybody one more time? You're taking a test today. Don't don't not take it. Linux uses these as file systems, but I'm not going to ask that. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is the one last thing I'll do. This one. SMB. And NFS. So here it is. If I'm going from a Windows server to a Windows, I'm sorry, the other way around, a Windows client accessing a Windows server, I would use SMB server message block. If I'm going from a Linux server to a Linux, uh, I'm going from a Linux client to a Linux server, I'd use NFS. Let's try it again. Windows to Windows, SMB. Linux to Linux, NFS. Lecture's over, right? Well, I have my little marker, so I'm going to do the sexy part. When I'm done with this, I'll be through for today, but it's very difficult. Where is it? Ah, this one. Watch carefully. We're going home after this, but I want to get it in. Then we can do the next one. So what did I say? Windows to Windows SMB. Linux to Linux NFS. Now. I've got now... It's a Linux server. And coming out of it is NFS. Now, what I've got here is, and by the way, I'm not going to draw it in, but if I had a regular Linux client, it would go right to there. Now I've got what's called a Windows client. Now here's my problem. The Windows client is coming out of here with what? SMB. Now, I'm, if I want to go to a Windows server, very easy. But now I'm going to come out of here with SMB, and I'm going to go to a Linux server, and I got a problem. This is only using NFS. This is using SMB, how they talk to each other. And the key thing is this guy here. So let's write this down. SMB, and I'm going to put an A here and an A here. That's the South American dance called the Samba. So what does SMB do? It adds SMB where it, where it isn't. So I'm going to run, and make sure I can, this is very difficult. S A M B A. I'm going to run Samba. Where am I going to run it? I'm going to run it here. Why would I want to run it there? Because Linux doesn't have SMB. Now, all of a sudden, because I'm running Samba there, now look what I'm going to do. Coming out of here, I'm going to have SMB. Oh, hey, Professor, I thought you said that Linux only had NFS. Yes, it normally does, but because you run Samba here, you're adding SMB to it, and now these two guys can talk. What is Samba? It adds SMB where it isn't. Now, where would you run it? Would you run Samba on a Windows machine? Of course not. Why? Why would you add SMB to a Windows machine which already has SMB? What are you going to run it on? A, a Linux machine that doesn't have SMB. Let's do a backward slide. 
Windows to Windows SMB, Linux to Linux NFS. If I want a Windows client to a Linux server, I would have to run Samba on the Linux server to get SMB where it isn't. I'm leaving this up so people can see it. Uh, I'm going to stop the lecture in a minute. Let me just go back to here. So I didn't draw anything. Windows to Windows SMB. Linux to Linux NFS. I don't need anything. Linux to Linux NFS add nothing. Windows to Windows SMB add nothing. We're done. But if I have a problem, and that is if I have a Windows client to a Linux server, then I have SMB coming out of here, but I don't have SMB coming out of here. I run Samba there. It's a software package called Samba. What does it do? It adds SMB where it isn't. Where isn't it? It's not in Linux. Where is it already? It's already in Windows. Would I ever run Samba on Windows? No, because I already have SMB. What? Want to run Samba on Linux? Yes, because that's where I need SMB. What is my favorite expression? Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Okay, you got to know a lot of stuff. Right? I have a lot more to do, but because it's 4 12, 4 15, I'm wearing out. Can I make a couple of just quick announcements? Everybody, you are having a test today. Okay, so please remember to take the test on chapter 7, 8, 9. Okay, don't go home without taking a test. Kevin Morales, I got you in. Okay, good. I'm trying to see, I'm Mr. B. All right, please take your test today, and I'll see you next time, and we're going to finish this. The next test in December is 10, 12, and 13, not 10, 11, 12. Again, one last thing, don't go home without taking a test. Uh, I think I'm done. Have a good day, Professor. Okay, Kevin Morales. Kevin, I, I got everybody in.